A lot of churches in the world today have got deacons. And um, the, the idea of deacons first appears in the New Testament right here in Acts chapter 6. And um, in some churches, deacons is kind of like a leadership position. Um, but we find out some surprising things about deacons in this chapter. Let us read. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, a complaint arose from the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily service. The twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not appropriate for us to forsake the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, select from among you brothers seven men of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will continually, we will continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the word. These words pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. When they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples greatly multiplied in Jerusalem. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of faith and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. But some of those who were of the synagogue called the Libertines, and of the Cyrenians, of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, arose, disputing with Stephen. They weren't able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and came against him and seized him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. All who sat in the council, fastening their eyes on him, saw his face like it was the face of an angel. All right, short little chapter. So there was, you, you might remember that um, from time to time, someone would sell a house or a land and they would bring the money and lay it at the apostles' feet and they would destroy they would use that money to make sure no one had any needs. And you might remember that in Jerusalem at this time, there originally were pilgrims from all over the world, but some of them had stayed because of the things that God was doing. And so they're sharing all their possessions. And so there's a group of Jewish Christians here, but they're Jewish people who are from Jerusalem. But there's also, and they're called the Hebrews, and there's a group of Christians who are Jewish, but they're from all over the world. They're called the Hellenists. There are these two groups, the Greek-speaking Jews, the Greek-speaking Christians, and the Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking Christians. They're, they're like two different groups. And it says here, a complaint arose from the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking ones, that their widows were being neglected in the daily service. So, you know, with the money that's being donated and they're making sure everyone gets fed and looked after, some people, it seems, were not quite getting treated the same. The 12 say, the 12 apostles say, it's not appropriate that we stop what we are doing to take up the responsibility of waiting on tables. In other words, the apostles were called by the Lord to do a certain job, preaching and teaching, and it, it wouldn't be right for them to stop doing what God wanted them to do so that they could serve food. But feeding the poor is important. So that must happen too. So therefore select from among you yourselves seven men, deacons. <laughs> Their job is to feed the poor, is to feed the needy. And the word deacon literally means one who waits on tables, like a waiter. You go to a restaurant, someone comes and brings you food, they're a waiter or a deacon. <laughs> now, so it's it's morphed from this kind of like idea of someone who has a task of feeding the poor. It's got to morph from that into a leadership position in many churches today. I know in our church, Peace, we used to have the pastors and the deacons. 
and the deacons were like the church council. They would pray along with the pastors and, you know, make decide important decisions for the church, this local church of peace. Well, after a while, um, you know, we still have a church council, but we don't call them deacons anymore. They're just important people, important men, and we recycle them. And, uh, you know, they all take a turn for a year or two, and then they leave and get someone else has to go. We don't have anyone that stays there permanently because it's something they do to serve the church with their prayer and their life. And the position of deacon is actually a serving position. So um, it's, it's kind of morphed <laughs> into in, in many congregations as a kind of leadership position. And I know in some denominations, they have this whole discussion. In the Catholic Church, for example, they've got three levels. They've got bishops and then priests and deacons. And they're the, these are like the three levels of leadership. And um, I know that there's a whole discussion going on in Catholicism about can women be deacons? Well, in the Anglican Church, well, this is the Episcopalian denomination, you know, women can be deacons and women, in Australia at least, can be priests. They're having a discussion, can women be bishops? <laughs> so in those two denominations, deacons is like the, the lowest level of church leadership. Um, but here... It's a, it's a service position. It's something that people were called to do to serve others. I think technically, you know, if, if you've got someone in your church office whose job is answering the phones and, and they organize things for the church, they're a kind of like a deacon because they're like serving everybody. There'd be people in your local church that are doing things for free, like cleaning the toilets every week. They're a deacon. They're like, you know, in, according to the biblical way of thinking, they're serving the church. And um, so <laughs> that's an explanation of that. And then they go and choose seven of them. Now, I have to say something. I don't want to be controversial. I don't feel like I am. But in, in Christianity, there are, th th roughly speaking, three ways that churches manage themselves. There's what's called Episcopalian government. And that's where you've got, it's like a top-down government, like kind of like the military, you know, there's, you know, a general and majors and captains and goes down to privates. That's kind of like a hierarchical system. Well, in church government, that's called Episcopalian and you've got bishops usually and then priests or, or leaders underneath them and then underneath them, people. That's Episcopalian government. And um, then you've got what's called Presbyterian government and that's where church leadership is comprised around elders. Presbyteros is the elder. So churches will often have a, a committee of elders and um, the pastor is usually one of the elders. And then above that, like the Presbyterian denomination, for example, will have um, a presbytery, which often has a higher up level of elders. And then there's a third type of government called congregational government, which is um, where the people kind of like the congregation governs the church, they vote. Congregational government often gets their biblical justification from this chapter because they would say, oh, the people, they were the ones that chose the deacons. That's like an example of congregational government. But actually it's not. It's actually not an example of congregational government because in verse 2 and 3 it says here, the 12, that's the apostles, summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it's not good for us to forsake the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, select among yourselves seven good brothers. The person, the people who made the decision were actually the apostles and they delegated the decision. They could have decided these seven people are going to be deacons, but they delegate the decision. And so therefore the people select. So it's an example of church community at work and all around the world, churches do often operate through community and consensus. That's essential. It's essential that church leadership is mindful of the consensus of the people and they you know, get them involved in praying with you and that's important, but it's actually important that anointed leaders make a decision. And so I, um, here at Peace, um, we've had a lot to say over the years about apostles and elders. So um, what all of these official forms of government are lacking are apostles, but apostles are supposed to be a part of the body of Christ. So there's actually another type of church government that, that kind of doesn't exist at the moment, but at some point it will, <laughs> apostolic leadership. And I think the Lord will restore that at some point. And if you've got questions about that, you should read 
um, books by John Kingsley Alley, my father, he has got things to say about that. So the people choose seven deacons. Stephen is the one we all know. Um, Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus. In the commentary that I was reading yesterday, it said that three of these names were Greek, three of these names were Hebrew, and one of these was a Jewish proselyte. So a um, so what we've got here is we've got, roughly speaking, half of the deacons would be Hebrew Jews, half of the deacons would be Greek Jews, and one of them was kind of half and a half. <laughs> So uh, the commentary said that was a very political choice of deacons. Well, I don't, I don't know if it was or not, or whether the Holy Spirit just did it that way. And um, But Nicholas, or Nicolaus, the last one here, he turns out bad. The first one of these, Stephen, turns out great. He's the first martyr, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. The last one of these, Nicolaus, turns out bad. And later on, he starts a group called the Nicolaitans, and in the book of Revelation, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches, and one of those churches, he says, you hate the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So there you go. The Nicolaitans turned out to be a kind of a heretical group that went off in a weird angle and did things that displeased God. Well, one of these deacons, Nicolaus, sadly, that was him. But Stephen, the first of the seven deacons, he turned out great. And it's said here that some people in Jerusalem were debating with him from the synagogue of the Libertines. Apparently, there were, apart from the temple, there were many synagogues in Jerusalem, more than 400. One of these synagogues was called the Libertines, a synagogue of freed men. In other words, people that had been slaves but now become free. That synagogue had freed men in it. They were debating with Stephen. Stephen was um, very good at the debates. They didn't like him. They put false charges against him. He gets brought before the council. And in the very next chapter, we're going to find out about what happens in his court case. However, the very last verse of this chapter says that he was brought before the council. It says, all who sat in the council fastened their eyes on him and they saw that his face was lit up like the face of an angel. That's the end of the chapter. Now, I think... It's just me, but I'm thinking that's a really interesting line. Luke wasn't there. How would Luke have known this? Who did he get it from? <laughs> well, he got it from someone who was there. Later on, Luke comes to Jerusalem and he does interviews. Now, we, we, we don't officially know that he does interviews, but we do know that he researched for the writing of the Gospel of Luke and for the writing of the book of Acts, he comes to Jerusalem and he meets people who were here. However, I don't think he gets it from anyone when he comes to Jerusalem. I think he gets it from Paul, because guess what? Paul was there, and we're going to find that out in the very next chapter. So it's like an eyewitness testimony straight from Paul. I think it's kind of cool. Father, I want to thank you for this chapter, chapter 6, the appointing of deacons and a bit of clarity about church government. I pray your grace would be upon us and Lord, help each one of us to have the heart of a servant in wanting to serve your people. In Jesus' name, amen.